All right. So we are going to talk about what is a channel model, what is path loss, fading, shadowing. So these are the words that we will be using when we talk about wireless networks. Um, then um, power law, fractional zones, tape, uh, uh, tabbed, delay line model, and Doppler spread. Doppler we already talked about a little bit, but we'll talk more more today. So the radio channel. So basically, if you take the transmitter and a receiver, the line between them is what is transmitting the signal, and we call it a channel. Channel is another name for a river or something like that, a stream. So it's not really one thin line. It's, it's a wide area that, you know, over which the signal flows. And um, so when we say channel, radio channel, that is what it is, is things which are in the line and some things around it. And um, so there are, there is a lot of noise, and we will, we will have a slide just on the noise. And then there is shadowing. Shadowing as the name, the play, uh, name indicates shadow. So whenever light travels, if there is something in the path, you will get a shadow. Same thing when you have wireless signal, and um, something is in the path, there is some area behind that object where the signal will not be accessible, and not uh, you know, audible or whatever you want to call it, receivable. So that is called shadowing, and actually we'll have more statistical um, representation of that. And then if the object is moving, then there's a Doppler issue. The frequency changes, the number of cycles that you receive changes, and multipath. And we talked about echoes, so if the signal goes, it echoes from that path, it echoes from there, echoes from there, and multiple copies come in, and that is called multipath. And because of all this, we have inter-symbol interference, because even if you sent very, you, know, you spoke for a very little amount, because of the echo, the signals will come, will keep coming for a long time and two symbols may interfere with each other, may just overlap each other. So that is called inter-symbol interference, all right? Now we have already talked about several of these, and I'm just repeating them here because we're going to go into more detail of these. Um, and um, so first thing is the channel model. So if you want to really figure out how much signal is reaching, we need a model. So then we can figure out whether this technology is good for 500 meters or 5 kilometers, is it good for moving vehicles, is it good for cities. So we need a model. As I said, channel is the area or, or the line between um, the transmitter and the receiver. And so when we say channel model, we have a model which tells you how much power will be received. And generally, it is it is basically represented by a frequency model like this. Power as a function of frequency, this is the received power, as a function of frequency is some function HF times the transmitted power as a function of frequency. So both the powers are a, are a graph. They are, not, they are not just in one number. So when you say transmitted power, you cannot say, well, I am transmitting 5 watts. You have to say, well, I am transmitting at this frequency, 2 watts, at this frequency, 2.5, 3, so there is a whole graph, right? So that's why we have XF. XF is the sent signal, YF is the received signal, and HF actually is, is a matrix which we multiply it by, and that matrix is called the channel model. All right, that depends upon the medium. So this depends upon the transmitter, this depends, basically this is what you receive depending upon the location, and this is the channel model. NF is whatever is not explained, and that is called noise. So like any other model, we have some explained part and some unexplained part. Unexplained part is the noise. All right? So it turns out this is a multiplicative model. We are taking the channel model, multiplying it to the signal power, to get the output power. And if you were to go back in time, I mean, go back to time domain, remember, uh, I mean, this is a mathematics which I don't think we can go into this class, 
but whenever you want to go to fre from frequency to domain to time domain, you need to do Fourier transforms and stuff like that. And whenever you multiply in one domain, it becomes a convolution in the other domain. Okay. So this is a multiplication here, and therefore it is a convolution in time. And um, so the model is generally expressed in the frequency domain. So whenever we talk about um, most of the time from now on, we will be talking mostly in the, actually we will be talking bo both the domains back and forth, but when we talk about channel models, we are talking about the frequency domain. So HF is the channel response, NF is the noise, X, Y, H, and N are all functions of the signal frequency. These are all, all functions and not numbers, right? So each of them is a function, so basically it's like a graph, curve. All right. For example, XF could be just a sequence of numbers and array. This is frequency, power, frequency, power, frequency, power, frequency, power, right? So you have a continuous graph. That is XF. Similarly, YF is another graph, right? Now, HF is a matrix, which is 2 by 2 matrix. So you take one vector, multiply, not 2 by 2. It is two-dimensional matrix. You take a matrix, multiply it by the vector, and you get another vector. F is in hertz, Y is in power, Y is power. What is power measured in? DBs. Right? So, however, having said that, every model they specify, what is this in? So, even though we measure the power in DBs, here, I think uh, these might be in watts, though. I mean, the thing is, you have to keep transmitting, transferring from log domain to linear domain. And... Uh, so whenever there is multiplication like this, actually this is in watts. So, so the question is, dB is a ratio. So how do you measure power as a ratio? Well, what we do is, if we want to say 100 milliwatt, we use one milliwatt as the unit. Right? So one milliwatt would be zero dB. If you have two, two, 2 milliwatt, that would be 3 dB, right? Because we multiply by 10, take log base, log base 10 and multiply by 10, right? So, so yeah, so whenever we say power in dB, it's all basically in milliwatts. So now let's talk about the path loss. When you send some power out, it goes in a circle, right? and it goes in a sphere actually, right? And the area of the sphere is 4 pi d square, right? So whatever number of watts you have sent is spread. So as you go more and more distance, the power per unit area goes down by transmitted power divided by 4 pi d square. All right? Now, if you have an antenna which covers certain areas, if it's a big antenna, it will cover more area. If it is a small antenna, it will cover little area. So it will collect that times AR power, PT divided by 4 pi d square times AR power it will cover, it will, it will collect. It's like collecting light. If you have a bigger solar cell, you will collect more light. If you have a smaller solar cell, you will collect little light, little amount of light. Right? So this gives you the amount of power collected and GT is the gain of the transmitter. If the transmitter is such that instead of sending it all over equally, it sends in a directional so that there is more power going, then that is called the gain of the transmitter. Right? I'm coming to you. So gain of the transmitter. So the received power is actually PT times GT times 4 pi d square AR without much thing, but I think we will have to add one more, which is the GR. If the receiver is such that it can collect more, so all that is, all that is, um, it turns out that the receiving antenna gain depends upon the wavelength, and therefore the, the and it turns out that if the wavelength is um, more, you get less power and less gain. So if you put that formula here, then really the received power is transmitted power times the transmitter gain times the receiver gain times lambda upon four pi d square. Whenever we talk about and then as we say, okay, this antenna has this much gain. And when we talk about receiving antenna, we also have a gain for that. And then we say how much power we are transmitting. And so receiving power would be transmitted power times the transmitted antenna gain times the receiving antenna gain divided by the distance and wavelength. 
right, multiply by this wavelength divided by 4 pi d square. So this is how the power changes. So the key thing to take from here is two things. First of all, the power goes down as you go away by what, what order? I mean, like if you go away with a factor of 2, how much the power will go down by? 4. It's going down by d square. Second thing is, power also goes down or up by the wavelength. Suppose you have a signal which has half the wavelength, means twice the frequency. If it has half the wavelength, how much power will you receive? You will get one fourth, right? If you have half lambda, sorry, if you have lambda which is half, then you will get one fourth. If you have lambda which is twice, then you will get four times, okay? And um, basically those are the two variables and then the GT and GR are the transmitter and the receiver gain. So a lot depends upon, so when we say that, you know, when we say well Wi-Fi will reach 200 meters, well it depends what kind of antenna and receiver you have. So we cannot just say for all antennas it will receive 100 meters, it will receive. So for a typical antenna you might receive 100 meters, for if you have a really bad antenna you might not go anywhere. If you have a very good antenna you might go 2 kilometers. So there is so many things which determine these distances and power and so on and so forth. And there are only so many things that are in our control. Maybe lambda is in our control. We can say, all right, we will use 2.4 gigahertz and not 5.6 gigahertz, you know. So we have choice of some spectrum, but other than that, the distance varies, the antennas vary, and so on. All right. Now, while that was theoretically true that we have power as a function of d square, it turns out the power is actually not a function of d square. In practice, when people measured, they found that after a certain distance, it is it is higher power. It might be d square up to a certain distance, but after a certain distance, it is higher power. So after a distance, let's call d break, it is to the power minus n, where n is anywhere from 3.5 to 5.5. Um, if we were to use that pre previous formula, but if the d break was 1 meter, then um, and n is actually equal to 2 like before, then it, you get 20. If it is not, then you will get 10 n here. So depending upon the d break, uh, you might get, so generally we are beyond the d break point, and we are actually, so then there is another theoretical way to explain why that is between 3.5 and 5.5 is because of the multipath. If you just take two paths, Suppose this is a transmitting antenna, this is a receiving antenna, and you just take two rays, one which goes straight down, one which goes by one reflection, just two rays. Actually, there are multiple rays here, okay? There might be another reflection, there might be another reflection, which is too difficult to calculate. So let's just take two-ray model. And people have done this modeling. If they use two-ray model, then they find out that they can prove that the received power equal to the transmitting power divided by GTGR times HT HR divided by D square whole square. HT is the height of the transmitting antenna, HR is the height of the receiving antenna, so it also depends how high these antennas are. Why they depend on how the antenna are? Because if you are very close to the ground, you can't have much reflection. On the other hand, if you are very high on the mountain, you have a lot more possibility of signal getting through. The earth itself acts as a barrier. And therefore, now you notice another, notice that, um, and this is valid if, if, you, if you are far away. How much far away? If you are away at least 4 ht hr divided by lambda. If you are that far away, then it is fourth power. And so, so three, two or three things I want to notice from here. First thing is that while d square was a very simple form method which assumed there is only one signal which is being transmitted and it goes all around, there is nothing you know, to block it, to reflect it, or anything like that. But in the real scenarios, there are lots of reflectors. And if we just use one reflection, we get a d4 formula, right? Second thing is, the reflections depend upon the height of the item. If the high, uh, item is high up in the sky, so that it is really like a true antenna, 
that we modeled before, where there is no, I mean, then it is, then it might be d squared. But if it is real near the ground, then it is ht square and hr square come in the, in there, and therefore the higher both of them are, the better it is. Right? If we increase the transmitting antenna to twice the height, we get four times the signal. If we increase the receiving antenna twice the height, we get four times the signal. Now, do we have control over the receiving antenna? In some cases we do, in some cases we don't. When you're having a cell phone, I don't have a control. I mean, we cannot say that, okay, hold it like this. On the other hand, if you have, um, if you have a building, wireless building antenna, you could put it on the top. And that's what we do. We don't put it in the ground for several reasons. Take first, this formula. Second thing, in the ground there are so many block, block, blocking things. Out high in the roof, there is more clearance, less shadows. Right? And, but we do have a lot of control over the transmitting antenna. Right? HT. That is why all the transmitting antennas, cell phone antennas, radio antennas, TV antennas, they are put where? They are put on the big mountains and the big towers. Right? You go on the highway and you see a mountain and you see a tower on the top of the mountain and there they put the antenna. So it is few meters and it gives you the formula here, HT and HR. So I mean, there is no common value for HT. HR you can say maybe, you know, height of a man. But and then lambda is also varying. So lambda basically, you know, whatever we do, you know, in this class, mostly 2.5 gigahertz. I think that translates to 12 centimeters, but I have to do the calculation again. So let's say 12 centimeters you put for lambda, and uh, HR is one meter, or two meters, then you can calculate the difference. It's few meters. So actually the thing is, generally we are not that close to the transmitting antenna anyway, unless you go on the top, on that mountain, you're far away. So, um, you are generally following this d square, d raised to 4 law. Alright? There is one more thing that there is, because the real environment is so variable, all these formulas are big approximation, they are big heuristics, they are just, you know, I mean, some kind of measured values. So you, you know, if we cannot say that the power is literally 4. It could be 1.5, it could be 3.5, it could be 5.5 but it's close to 4 somewhere, okay? So it's not mathematically accurate, it's just basically mathematically accurate, but the real world is not, you know, simple to model. And therefore, um, there is so much variability, right? All right, so now we understand if you follow the d raised to minus 4 law, if you go to distance of twice Instead of 1 kilometer, you go to 2 kilometers. How much the power goes down by? It goes to distance raised to 4. So if you go down the, if you go down the D is factor of 2, then the power goes down by 16. Every time you go down by factor of 2, you go, the power goes down by factor of 16. Every time you go down the power of 3, uh, distance of 3, you go 3 kilometers, the power goes down by how much? 3 raised to 4, and 3 raised to 4 is 81, so we like 1 percent. So you get, you know, very little power as you go distance, so that's why, you know, basically, you know, we cannot go too far from the cell tower. All right, this is how the measured values look like. So somebody did the measurement of power as a function of distance. We talked about d square law, we talked about d raised to 4 law. None of them really accurate. They're all approximation. The real power varies widely like this. The blue line is the measured power, and what we have done here is we are ma we are plotting the dB power, log power, and on this side we are plotting the log distance. So if it was a squared, it would be a straight line. A fourth power would be a straight line. You see, but this might be close to fourth power. This might be close to whatever in between, power of 2 or something, and so, so this is what it looks like. Okay? Again, this is just an approximation. Now, your, this answer your question is right here. The transition happens around 100 meters, so for this measurement, 
if you go through all the frequency and whatever else was done for this measurement, the D break was more like 100 meters. All right. And generally, I mean, so we can forget the anything below the break because we are never close that close to the transmitter, unless it is Wi-Fi or something where you know the transmitter might be right here in this room. Otherwise, we stay away from the antenna. Let's talk about changes in the signal. Changes in the signal is called fading. Now, if you move your receiver just by a centimeter, so it was here, and it moved just one centimeter it can make a big difference. You know why? Because the si signal wavelength is 12 centimeter or something like that, right? Signal wavelength is in that order. So whatever you are receiving, its phase can change. And if the phase is such that they cancel out, then you get nothing from two signals. You get one, wave, one reflection and you get second reflection. And the two reflections can cancel out. On the other hand, if the phase is such that they add, then you get twice the signal. All right? In real position, you might get somewhere between zero and that, depending upon where you move. By moving slightly, you cancel out some reflections and you make some reflections add. And so as you move, the power can change. This variation in power by small movement is called a small fading. Similarly, there is a large scale fading. If you take the signal from here to there, then you could make a big change. For example, if you were here and there was nothing in the way, you got high power. On the other side, you took it so that there's not a big building in the way, power is cut down, right? And then you come to the other side of the building, the power goes back again. So this is called large scale fading, large scale change in the signal. So there are both effects. Little effect because of the reflections and the big effects because of the shadowing. If you read any book on wireless communication, it's full of equations because this is so much statistics and modeling goes around with it. And so this is one of the things that if you were to model the shadowing, and we will actually just need to know this thing, and we are not really, because we are going to concentrate more on the higher layers. Rest of this lecture after this, after this and the next part three of this five, five layer is on the higher layers. But we need to use these words. If I say shadowing, if I say, you know, four type delay line model, this and that, you should understand that. So here our goal is to explain to you what these are. But, but if you were to take course on wireless communications, then we will be spending a lot more time in deriving many of these formulas. But here, the power loss actually depends upon the distance and then there is a noise term, psi, chi, and this is a Gaussian random variable with a standard deviation sigma square. So this is generally like any other noise. The noise is modeled as a Gaussian random distribution or normal random distribution. And um, since this is a log formula, if you were to take anti log, the in that formula, the, the noise will be log normal distribution. So if something is normal in the log domain, then when you take the anti-log, it becomes log normal. So we say that this is a log normal shadowing. Now shadowing could be log normal, could be different. So people would go to some area and say, well, we measured the shadowing and it looks like log normal shadowing is okay, is a good model. Or maybe it is not a good model. But these are the names and terms we use. So now, um, what does Gaussian mean? Yeah, that's a distribution. And, and it is the most common distribution. And that's why it is called the normal distribution. The normal distribution is Gaussian distribution. So here I used many terms, including Gaussian and the standard deviation and, um, and normal and log normal. So basically, this is somewhat statistical. Uh, and I don't think we need to go too much detail here, except to present that really the, these variations are presented as a noise because they can change very, I mean, depending upon you know, where you are, and they are modeled as a normal distribution in the log domain. Now, if you were to plot a graph where you plot transmitted, sorry, received, received divided by transmitted as a function of D, 
distance in both cases it is log this is in db and this is in log d generally you should get a straight line with power 4 it will be a slope of minus 4 if it was a square you get a slope of minus 2 if it was five, fifth power you will get a slope of minus 5 so this is the line we are looking for but really in the real world you won't get a line like that what you would get is along that line there would be some big variations that is what we call you know this is shadowing and along that line you will get some little variations so this is a small scale fading actually and so this is really the path loss alone this is because of the shadowing this big variation and this little variation is because of that small scale fading right which could be because of you know reflections and things like that all right so the actual signal looks very weird and it's somehow you have to figure out the this um, distance um, power from that so the noise actually there are three types first is the thermal noise and the thermal noise is simply because of the temperature as the temperature goes up the molecules they vibrate more of all the things and as they vibrate more there is more noise okay so that is called thermal noise and thermal noise can be easily be modeled by a linear thing where the noise density is equal to is straight away proportional to the absolute temperature what is absolute temperature so if you if i gave you 0 degrees how much is that in the absolute temperature 273 right anyway this constant is called boltzmann constant and its value is so much so given a temperature you can calculate how many joules of power you have noise power and if you have a signal which has a width of b then it gets b times that much noise and so you can calculate that formula as well then there are two other noise second is the spurious noise which is because of things which are going around so if you have somebody doing the car starting the car or somebody starting a radio or somebody starting a computer all of these things are radiating stuff so that is the that's another emission and then the receiver noise and the receiver itself has electronics which could have its own noise and so so there are receiver noise there is some noise from the environment and there is noise due to the temperature thermal temperature those are the three main components of the noise <coughs> and as you go farther and farther your signal keeps going down and down so this graph here shows the signal as a function of distance so as the as signal goes down while the noise keeps going up noise keeps going up the less noise you have the better signal and better you know number of bits you can get better good bits you can get more good bits you can get as the noise gets closer and closer to the signal less and less good bits you get right and at some point basically the noise will be more than the signal and you won't be able to get any good bits so so basically whenever we design a wireless system we have to design such that there is signal to noise ratio is minimum so we say well it has to be a minimum of minus 90 db if the signal to noise ratio goes below minus 90 db so if it goes to minus 100 db our system will not work so there is a minimum sensitivity as we call it and that is called sir signal to interference ratio SIR minimum that has to be minimum on the right of that the system will not work on the left of it the system is good the next concept is important concept is fresnel Jones so if you have a transmitter and you have a receiver we generally say that the channel is the line between them right however the channel is not just that line I said there is a lot of area around it which is also used by the signal and it reaches the destination so some signal might reach like this some might reach like that some might reach from there and so on and so forth 
So if there is a tree in any of this area here, if there is a tree or there is a house or a building in any of this area, not just in the line of sight, here signal will be reduced. Right? So, so what we do is, we say that the ellipse, this ellipse, which has these two as the focal point, these two receiver and the transmitter as the focal point, that is, that first ellipse is the fresnel zone. If anything comes in that area, the signal will be reduced more than if it comes in the second, you know, we can draw many ellipses, bigger and bigger ellipses around that. And the first one is called fresnel zone. So these are called fresnel zones. First fresnel zone, if something comes in there, if there is a tree which is not in the line of sight, but it is near the line of sight, this will affect the signal. And so we say that if there is a blockage in the first fractional zones, what is the first fractional zone? Here is what is defined as. Is the ellipsoid which, which has a run length of line of sight plus i lambda by 2. So run length is this. If you take this distance plus this distance, sum of those two, and ellipsoid, by the way, is that. Ellipsoid is simply all the points which have equal distance. So if you take a thread, thread, then this two sum is constant, and as you move the pen around with that thread around, you will get an ellipse. That's how you draw an ellipse, is you can put a thread, and then you can just move the pen around. So the distance, sum of these two will remain constant. Right? So. If the sum is line of sight, which is this distance, plus 1 lambda by 2, that is the first fractional zone. If you have 2 lambda by 2 or 3 lambda by 2, that is the nth fractional zone. So, and, um, so basically, the radius of the ith ellipsoid at the distance the dt from the transmitter is this much. Now, these ellipsoids are not simply ellipse, they are three dimensional. Ellipse is in two dimensions. Right? If you take that ellipse and you rotate it around, you get an ellipsoid. Okay, it's like this. If you take a circle and you rotate it, you get a what? A sphere. If you take a circle and you rotate it, you get a sphere. Similarly, you take an ellipse and you rotate it, you get ellipsoid. So that ellipsoid has a radius. Radius is basically this thing, the maximum distance from this straight line. That would be the radius of this amount i lambda dt upon dr upon dt plus dr. And the free space law is followed up to the distance at which the first fractional zone touches the ground. So uh, at which the first fractional zone touches the ground. So if the objects are so far away from the ground that the first fractional left side doesn't touch the ground, then you follow d square law. And as soon as you go up, you follow other laws. Okay, so so far, before I answer your question, there are few things I introduced here. First of all, you should know what is an ellipse. Ellipse is simply all the points that are the same distance from the two focal points. Same, I mean, sum of the distance from the focal point is constant. Ellipsoid is what you get when you rotate that ellipse. And then if the ellipse and the ellipsoids are such that the distance is straight lambda LOS plus 1 lambda by 2, that is the first personal zone, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So now if I say later on, later on in that, you know, this has to be, so whenever basically generally we like that when you have a ear transmitter and receiver, that the first personal zone be clear, which means that there is no tree or no building, not only in the line of sight, but, you know, lambda by 2 away from that thing, you know, I mean, like, you know, you can, you can use this formula to find exactly what we mean. BS is the base station, I use the term without defining them here. MS is the mobile station. So base station is the one which goes on the mountain and mobile station is what is on the ground. And, you know, the mobile station, like us, you know, when I have a cell phone, you know, this is the mobile station and the tower is the base station. Okay, so I is an integer number. Yeah, so basically I could be 1, 2, 3. If I could be even 0. Suppose I is 0, then all you get is line of sight. One ray. I mean, 
you know, that's a special case of ellipsoid, but it's really not an ellipsoid. But if you put i equal to 1, then you get this mass and this, uh, this three-dimensional um, uh, zone, i equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on and so forth. So i is an integer which defines many different ellipsoids. It, it, it could be that, you know, we are talking here, but somebody, something in the mountain is going to affect us. Yes, it, it will. I mean, in particular, if we are in the outside. And so everything affects, but the effect is very little. All right? As you go into higher i values, the effect is going less and less. But when we say the line of sight is clear, we don't mean just one line here, LOS. We mean at least the first rational zone. So then the signal engineers sit down and they do how much power we are going to receive, so whether we can get there or not. So let's say you transmitted the power 30 watts, you convert that into dB, and so 30 watts becomes 45 dBm. Now let's just do that little calculation and see if that is correct. So log base 10 of 2 is 0.3. That you should remember by heart. Log of 2 is 0.3. Then you might remember log of 3. Log of 3, I don't remember exactly, but it is close to 0.5. Okay? And then log of 5 is 0.7 or something like that. Okay? So those are approximate numbers. So now, since I don't remember whether it is 0.5 or not, I would take it that it is 4.5. Okay? Then 4.5, so if you want to take 30 watts and you want to convert into dBs, you take 30 watts divided by 1 milliwatt. And divide by 1 milliwatt, you get 30,000. You take log base 10 of 30,000, so 10,000 come out. So 4 comes out right away, so that is 44 plus 0.5. So 4.5 and then multiply by 10. So you get 45. That's how you get 45. 30 dB is 45. Sorry, 30 watts is 45 dB. Then the cable loss is 5 dB. So the cable which goes from the box, electronic box to the antenna, antenna is on the top or box is on the ground, there is a big cable going there, that has a loss of minus 5 dB. The antenna gain is 10 dB and therefore the EIRP is 50 dB. So this, the sum of these, this is what is equivalent isotropically radiated power. So isotropic means spherically radiated power. If we had a spherical antenna, and an antenna which is a point, and it was transmitting in all directions equally, then you would get 50 dBm going out in all directions. Now the receiver sensitivity is 100 minus 100 dBm. So if the power is less than that, the receiver cannot understand at all. So we have to get this much. The fade margin is 12 dB because there is a variation of the, because of the small fading and all that. So we allow 12 dB for that. So the minimum received power should be the sum of those two minus 10 dBm. And so the minus 10, 90 dBm and plus 50. So the difference is 140 is the last, last allowed. And um, at D break of 100 meters, 72 dB. And beyond the break point, it is 68 dB. So up to 100 meters we can have 72 dB, we will have 72 dB loss and then from there it will be fourth power law or nth power law and so the rest remaining is 68 dB, so 140 minus 72 is 68 dB and therefore the distance if, now here we are assuming that the n is equal to 3.5, n is equal to 3.5 so if we, then we can go up to 8.8 .8 kilometer okay so if you put this equal to then uh, 68 dB, then you will calculate D equal to 8.8 .8 kilometer. So this is how the wireless engineers can figure out how far can we go. By, by calculating the transmitted power, subtracting the cable losses, and adding, adding the antenna, then looking at the power sensitivity fade margin. And there are many other things that you might want to put in. But generally what we do is in dB, the easy part is everything adds up. Because if it was not in dB, if it was working in watts, then you have to keep multiplying many of the things. Okay? But here, since it is all in dB, we just added 45 minus 5 and plus 10 and got 50. So then you can calculate the distance. Generally, we might give you a distance and then we have to calculate other way around. You keep calculating 
and you say how much margin there is or how much power to be transmitting or how much power to be receiving. So any one thing is un unknown, everything else is given and you calculate that unknown. So this is called link budget analysis. So the next variable is how do we represent the channel, right? So generally the channel, when, whenever you go to a place, there might be multiple reflectors. So even though you send one impulse, you will get multiple copies of that impulse at different power. So you might get one copy here, one copy there, one copy there after some delay. And the delay depends upon the reflection. You get one reflection like that, another reflection like that, and so on and so forth. And um, so we say that the received power has this profile. This is the transmitted power. So the received power has this profile. And this is actually purely dependent upon the channel as we call it. So this might be our channel model in the sense that if we were to send a power twice as much, all of these will multiply by two, but the location will remain the same. I mean, the location of these impulses will remain the same as long as you are in the same location, right? So this is the model for that location. So whenever you send one impulse, you get multiple impulses at different delays and so this is called the delay profile of the received power. And after some time, the received power is so little that we don't even care, but these are the major peaks. Actually, so this is not just, I mean, you might even get something in between here, but they might be so low that we can ignore. So these are the major peaks. All right. So this is one of the important models used and we will talk about that in the, we will talk about several models in the next lecture. But so one of the ways to represent channels is to represent by these impulses. So we have to say that if you send one impulse, it goes through a box where it is delayed by time tau 1 and it is decreased in power to C1. Then it goes to a second box, so the total delay is tau 2 and the total power left is C2. Then it goes to a third box and you get C3 and tau 4 and so on and so forth. So basically what we have done is this has been represented by a delay line tab delay line model. So this is a delay line. All is this is introduces a delay and we tap this line at some points and we get some power out. And so this is a representation which if we were to put mathematically would be lambda, sorry delta T, sorry, tau minus tau i. So this represents an impulse. This is a representation of an impulse at t equal to tau i, right? Tau at that point. So this is C1 is tau minus tau 1, delta. Cip is the amplitude. And so this means I have taken, in this case, we have taken 4, i equal to 1 through 4 impulses. And this is the model. This is the model for that channel, all right, time domain model. And in the frequency domain, you will have to just convert that back into frequency domain by using Fourier transform, etc. But this is the kind of model we will be using, at least, you know, uh, describing so that when you're a wireless, um, here is what happens, when you're a wireless engineer, and by the way, I got a job, I mean, request from somebody saying that they're looking for people wireless engineer just yesterday. I won't forward to you guys because you're not qualified yet. But um, if you're a wireless engineer, you'll be talking to people who are pure physicists. They don't know anyone networking, all right? But they speak these things. And they say, well, I think this channel is part tap delay line model and that there is fading and that there is shadowing and that there is, you know, this and that. If you don't understand their language, then you're in big trouble, right? That's why we have to, and if you read a paper on wireless technology design, you will have these terms. So that's why I have to introduce these terms without going too much details into them. And um, you need to understand these terms. So basically, I mean, for example, this whole thing about impulses, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, the thing is some of you have the mathematical background to understand how to represent impulses, and some of you don't, but at least you have to understand enough so that you can do your part which is coming up later. So here, what I have done is I explained to you that if you, if you have an environment, 
you will send one impulse and you will get multiple impulses. Right? That's clear, right? Why you will get multiple impulses? Anybody? Why do you get multiple impulses? Because of reflections. Now, so you represent that environment by what we call a tabbed delay line model. So basically, if you send some signal here, it is delayed and it comes out at different amplitude at different points. Alright? So when we want to represent this, we could just tell you how much delay there is and how much amplitude is left and how much amplitude there is at that point, uh, delay, at that delay. And so that would be the model of the channel. And this is one of the most common model of the channel, trapped delay line model. In fact, ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, has several models, and actually there are other organizations that have other models that are basically tabbed delay line models. So this is very important to understand what is tabbed delay line. Basically, all we are saying is that if you have to send one impulse, you will get X and N impulses, and each impulse will have a certain delay and a certain amplitude. In addition, there is a Doppler spread. And the Doppler spread basically happens because if you are going towards, now let me ask you, if you are going towards the transmitter, will you get more cycles per second or less cycles per second? More, right, if you remember from the previous lecture. As you are going towards, you will get more cycles. I mean, it's like this, if somebody threw a stone in the water, waves are coming, and if you go towards that stone, you will get more waves. If you run away from the stone, you will get less waves, less cycles. Right? And so that is the Doppler spread. Doppler spread is the change in the frequency, perceived frequency, when the object, the receiver is moving. Or the transmitter is moving. It doesn't matter which one is moving. And um, so the Doppler power spectrum is the power distribution over the frequency. So, um, so if the power spectrum is non-zero for F minus D to F plus D, then this is the Doppler spread is FD. And um, opposite of 1 upon FD is called the coherence time or the time uh, in the time domain that is the period for which the frequency is constant or power is constant. So that is 1 upon that FD is called coherence time. Doppler spread is the frequency range after which the power is negligible. The Doppler spread is the spread or the change in the free power frequency distribution because something is moving either the transmitter or the receiver, or something else is moving. See, here is another interesting thing. Suppose both the transmitter and the receiver are fixed, but the car is going. The reflector is moving. Right? If reflector is moving, the power distribution will move, change. Right? So because of any motion of anything around, you have the Doppler spread. If there is a straight line and the send and receiver and one is moving, then we know we get more cycle, less cycle. But we get more cycle, less cycle because anything else moves, we get more cycles, less cycle. Why? Because the reflections change. So, so that is the Doppler spread. So basically, when we model the channel, now in the next chapter, next lecture, we will talk about modeling a city, for example, environment. In the city environment, you have tall buildings, you have moving cars, you have this and that. All of this will have effect, right? And when you design a cellular system or you design a wireless system, you have to make sure that this can take care of all of these things. So here is a typical Doppler spread. If you are working in the 2.45 gigahertz band and you are moving at 2 kilometers per hour, Doppler spread is 4.6 hertz and so on and so forth. For each frequency, generally, you, you get the Doppler spread. And one upon that is the time, it's called coherence time. So coherence time is simply one upon this spread. The spread is 4.6 gigahertz, sorry, 6 hertz, one upon 4.6 is 200 millisecond. Okay, so that is 0.2. One upon 4.6 is 0.2. One upon 100 is 0 0.01, so that is 10 millisecond and so on and so forth. 0 0.01 second is 10 milliseconds. So 1 upon this is the coherence time. And its coherence time is simply 1 upon FD. 1 upon the Doppler spread. Alright, that brings us to the end of this lecture.
and we have introduced many many terms here first of all we summarize that the path loss could be anywhere from power 2 to power 5.5 it is 2 where path loss the, the power is 2 where very close to the transmitter up to the break point after that it changes and it could be very typically 4 or actually 4 is number simply came out because of the 2-ray model but it could be anywhere from 3.5 to 5.5 so the fading is basically the change in the power in position as the position changes and the fractional zone now we understand fractional zone what is the fractional zone? it's that what is the name of the ellipsoid it's the ellipsoid around the line of sight over which we should not have any object. If there is anything comes in, then we'll say that the channel is not clear. And then we talked about coherence time. Coherence time is the time over which the system doesn't change, and so that is actually one upon the Doppler spread. So if the Doppler is spread, we calculate how many hertz it is, and then one upon that is the coherence time. 